recording now. Okay, right. that's fine. And you're okay with me recording on that and also my tape recorder, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I treat, honestly, I treat everything like it's recorded anyway. Awesome. Literally uh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a candid conversation with more than one ever over any sort of media without treating it like it's being recorded. Yeah, so. smart. Um, but thanks for taking the time to meet with me. I'm really excited to get to know you, but um, yeah, so I'm doing a class assignment about a profile piece on someone that we find compelling. And as soon as I came across your book, I was like, yeah, I need to learn more about uh, Sargent. So how did you, you got to remember that most of the people I interview with do not read the book. Yeah. They, they either saw the documentary or they saw the clues or they watched some other interview and they, they, so thank you by the way for reading it. Um, wh how did, how did you even hear about it? I don't even know. It just came up on a recommendation one time and just in the bottom and I was like, oh, I'll pin that for later. And then, really? yeah. So you, so you never saw the Netflix thing? No, I saw that after I started. Oh, okay. You. Yeah. Oh, well, because I, it was in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I haven't watched it yet. I've watched like a little bit, but I wanted to get a candy conversation first. Before sure. I really sure, sure. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I just have questions about, you know, you, what motivates you and you know, your beliefs probably. Yeah. Before, but hit me throw so, taking it back before 2014 who were you before you entered the flat earth world <laughs> i was a before 2014 i was a professional video game player turned software trainer mm -hmm. i got into software because i won a computer pinball tournament mm -hmm. And parlayed that into a software job at a startup in Boulder, Colorado. Just, I had never been to Colorado before. Thought it was a huge mistake uh, because when I flew out there, it was snowing, and I'm from Seattle, so I'd never seen that sort of snow before. Thought I had actually landed in Alaska. Had no idea what was going on, and over the next twenty years, uh, proceeded to teach proprietary software. I f flew around the country way before go to meeting and go to assist and all the other stuff and zoom, um, flew around the country and, and trained blue collar factories on really expensive, really complex time and attendance software. And that's, that's really what I did. Um, if you want to go back even further than that, I mean, I, I was born and raised in a little rural Island up in the Northwest corner of the United States. Mm -hmm. And, and was extremely sheltered and extremely naive and didn't believe that anyone would ever lie about anything ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't even, I think I said that in the book. It was like, I didn't, did not believe that people in authority would lie. Why would they lie? Mm -hmm. I grew up in the eighties when we didn't think like that. And it was like, <laughs> we're too, too busy having a good time. And um, then during, but, but the key was because I didn't get married or had kids, I had tons and tons and tons of free time on my hands. People don't understand how much free time you have if you don't ever get married and have kids. You just have oodles of it. And I spent a lot of it online. You know, I'm, that was one of my one of my staples was I was because I was there when the internet was was ramping up mm -hmm. and got into conspiracies. And when conspiracies hit the online community, that's when things just freaking took off. Because people didn't matter where you were, were comparing notes. It's like, hey, did you notice this little thing? Hey, did you notice this little thing? And seriously, over the next you know better part of twenty years, uh, I absorbed just about every conspiracy you could think of. So I had an opinion on it. Some I liked, some I didn't like, and I I never considered myself a tinfoil hat person. Mm -hmm. But that's what I did. And then twenty fourteen looked at flat Earth, and boy, what a great decision that was! Yeah, really, so really great. Take me from there. You you know opened this book about flat Earth and didn't even open a book. Okay. I I had. Um, I had looked at just about every conspiracy there was, and I was bored out of my mind when it came to the internet. I was like, you're not old enough to remember there were commercials out there back when the internet was fairly new. It's like, well, finish the internet, <laughs> you know, because you could. I mean, there wasn't that much out there. And I got into, I, I, there was just this random thing recommended to me on the, you know, recommended for you in YouTube. It's like, oh, this flat earth, stupid flat earth video from a guy in, from Canada, from Montreal, Matt Boylan, mm. and who you'll see in the do documentary. And he was, he was, the, it was riveting, absolutely riveting. I mean, his, it was all his girlfriend, you know, behind every great man. <laughs> he, that she sat him down sober. And I have to point that out because he is rarely sober. She sat him down sober on a couch 
probably in a weekend morning and she just turned the camera on and she said, okay, tell me the story. And he goes into his opinion on flat earth. And I was going, yeah, you know what? I'm going to look into this and decided to do my own research over the next nine months. And because I thought it really, it's stupid. It's, it's ridiculous. No one should ever look into flat earth, but I did. And then nine months later made the mistake of it's like, all right, internet here, here's my stuff. Show me where I went wrong and thought it would get blown out of the water and it didn't. And here we are. In fact, the clues turned six years old in uh, next month. In fact, in three weeks. And take me through these nine months of research. What were you doing? I was trying to remember at, by that point, I had, I had an, an, an opinion on just about every conspiracy there was. You name it. I, I had an opinion. On it. I was like, yeah, this one's awful. This one's not bad. You know what? This one I like all the time and I can't. But I looked at Flat Earth and I tried to disprove it. I really treated it like a court case, which is, okay, can I prove the globe in a court of law? Can I prove it? And the more, and I did it off and on. I mean, it wasn't like I was just hammering on it for nine months, but I was doing, I was every day, I was kind of looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. And I'd get to a point and there were these loose threads. There were things like, okay, this mostly proves the globe, but then there's these things that don't make any sense. And then the more I looked at it, the worse it got. Uh, I don't know if I talked about this in the book. It's kind of like looking at a child's, like a simple puzzle. Like you see somebody that's, that's, that's playing with a puzzle on a park bench and it looks simple from a distance. And you're going, why is this person having so much trouble with this thing? The guy's obviously, you know, handicapped in some way. And you, you see him frustrated and he puts the puzzle down and he leaves the park bench. And, and the longer you stare at this puzzle, the worse it gets. The, the more complex it gets to where you, you, you finally you run out of ideas. And you're like, you know what? So, sorry. So I looked at the, the research I did. I looked at, obviously, NASA. Because <laughs> you have to. Because uh, it, it, if, if the flat earth is real, then everything that NASA ever did is, is obviously fraudulent. Um, Navy, the United States Navy, because they were the ones that were doing research in Antarctica, which I thought was really interesting. Flight paths. Did you ever watch the original clues? Uh, five clues I haven't yet. No. Oh my god! Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's really those were the the bullet points I went into, which was uh, flight paths, gravity versus the vacuum of space, um, Admiral Byrd and the United States Navy, and of course NASA. Those were were the big ones. And the one that got me, the one that really inspired me to make the video series itself, was the um, was the Antarctic Treaty out of all things, because this world is based on greed and money and power. And everybody knows this, you know, that's what runs everything. It's, it's the, what gets things done and what's corrupts everything else. I mean, there's all, what was that great line from the movie, um, Sneakers? Uh, the worst thing about money is it allows bad people to continue doing bad things. But money has nothing to do with the flat earth. Meaning the Antarctic was when it was locked down in 1959, I mean locked down by this treaty, which is bulletproof. It basically said that no corporation, no matter how much money you have, can set up shop there for any reason, ever. Doesn't matter what country you are. And I'm going, what? I mean, that, that really piqued my interest because I have seen in so many of the conspiracies up until that point where money was the driving force. And money was how things got done. I mean, every even little political things to big political things, money was always the, the common denominator. But in this one, they took money out of the equation. They said, yeah, it doesn't matter how much money is involved. We don't want anyone going down there ever. And I, and I was going, wow, nobody paid attention to this whatsoever. I'm, I mean, I, what I like to tell people is that if they want it, I don't know if you have an opinion on it or not, but if they wanted to start fracking in your backyard tomorrow, they could almost make that happen, even without your consent. They would just go around your neighbors. They would just give briefcases full of money to everybody they could, and they would they would get into the ground. But with this, the oil and gas companies aren't, not only are they not allowed to go down there ever, they're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that got me. And from a journalistic standpoint, you should appreciate this. Meaning if I'm the head of, I don't know, Exxon or British Petroleum, I would be running full page ads in every major newspaper that, that's, that's politically relevant 
saying how great it would be for my only gas company to go down there. Right. And, and I would be greasing palms and I would doing all this stuff. I'd be throwing gobs of liquid assets to, at, to get to this place. No one has ever done it. No one's yeah. ever even peeped about it. And that just screwed. I, I knew exactly what, what was happening at that point. I was like, okay, someone at the NSA calls up the head of whoever and says, yeah, don't go down there. If you think about going down there, we're going to say it's a national security issue. Don't do it. And if you accidentally go down there, we will clean, you know, basically they, they locked it down so that no one accidentally went into places they didn't want them to go. That's, that's how, that's how important it was. They knew they could have let, I mean, we're talking billions and billions of dollars that were just shoved off the table because I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I got to get this point up, which is billions of dollars that were put, that were taken off the table because they didn't want to take a chance of a plane going off course or a helicopter going off course. That's a loose loose end you don't want to tie up. Eventually, kind of like why there were no stars in any of the, the moon shots, because it was just too much of a hassle. They're like, yeah, you know what, just no stars. No stars ever for anything ever. It's just too hard to, to deal with the constellations and lining them up with the date time stamps. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I don't even remember what the original question was. No, that answered it. Um, so- By the way, I like your very nice stack of books back there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so just to you know summarize so I understand it, that there is this Antarctica Treaty so that they don't discover that the Earth is not round or Earth. Well, what you would discover if you went out there, and, and again, my opinion, but it's shared by a lot of people, is that eventually thousands and thousands of miles inland, you would run into a barrier, the edge of the snow globe, the edge of the building. Because what we're talking about, and I think I said this in the book, is that you're living in a building. That's the short version. And don't don't fall into the trap of oh, it's an asteroid flying, a flat asteroid flying in space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's Asgard. It's the again the movie Thor did us no favors whatsoever. It's like oh, where's the cosmic waterfall? It's like oh god. Um, but yes, if you went too far, I mean, and it took the United States Navy thirty years to find it. You know, they started in 1927 and they didn't figure it out until Operation Deep Freeze, which was 55, 56. And that's when, you know, okay, if you find the outer marker, then you know you've got a problem. Because then, now, you, it wouldn't take people that long to figure out. It's like, oh, okay, well, if there's an outer barrier, then what the hell, you know, what sort of shape are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was, that was the big turning point. That was the motivation for me, the final motivation to make the clues. And so again, never really did anything with uh, video editing or anything like that before. Just had a YouTube channel. It's like, all right, threw it out there with all my contact info. Really great idea also. And uh, well, I mean, you found me. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's where it led. And so the videos were uploaded so that somebody could debunk them? Was that the intention? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the point. That was the point. I wanted to get some sleep. So I wanted somebody. So I put it out there because I knew I've been in enough forums in the internet, you know, I was, I'm, I was there in the beginning, you know, when this whole thing started rolling out, I knew that the internet as a collective hive mind is very, very intelligent, very, it's, it's the opposite of that line from men in black, where a person is smart, but people are dumb, panicky and dangerous. It's the opposite on the internet, the individual, not that smart, because they don't have, you know, the, the sum total of knowledge that's out there, but uh, the big group combined you know the hive mind really really intelligent so yeah it's just, all right here's my name my phone number my bank routing numbers you know social security number all that stuff threw it out there and we just held my breath and said okay who's gonna call me some i was waiting for some academic some somebody with a master's degree or higher in a physical science to call me up and say okay here's where you went wrong blah 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 you can shut down your youtube channel forever and i'd be like great sounds like a plan no one ever called to this day, six years later, no one has ever called um, along those lines. The, the, the academic community has avoided this like the plague. In fact, next week I'm doing, it's rare, maybe one out of every 50 interviews I do are with somebody from, from, from the science community. And I've got some, some grad students from, I think, Toronto. They're going to call me. I think they're physics students. It's like, okay, sure. Let's do that. I'll talk physics. In fact, I've had to relearn more science during this process than I ever remembered going, you know, going through high school and university. You know, you go through science classes and unless that's your major, you're like, yeah, yeah, I just want to get through it. 
so I can get on to what my specialty is. But with this, we had to relearn everything because we were the ones we had when if when you're trying to debunk this, you dig into it. You look up a lot of stuff, you know, about the earth and space and what mainstream says, and you try to make it fit. And it doesn't matter what field you're in. And so do you do a lot of interviews just on a daily basis for people? Not on a daily basis, but I have done. In fact, that was funny. I was thinking about that the other day uh, because 2020, what a bust that was. Um, the, cause I did, I, I did public speaking engagements in seven countries in 2019 and 2020 was starting out great. I had just gotten back from, uh, um, uh, one of the big morning shows in London. And as I was coming back, oh, in fact, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you real quick. So I was coming back and I had already heard from, I, I still don't have an agent. And he already heard from a guy over there who said, oh, yeah, can you fly back over to London for where we want to shoot um, a McDonald's commercial for Pancake Day? And pancake. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'd love you to do it. It's like, great, fantastic. And then what do you think happened? And it's like, oh, the borders started closing. <laughs> and that was it. I think I've done, I lost count, but I think I've done about one a week for the last six years. So... It's weird. It's been steady. So it's not a flash in the pan type thing where you get a whole bunch of inter interviews and then nothing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like it's it, again, completely. If I ever live long enough to write an autobiography, it'll be called unsolicited. I never had to pick up the phone. People just kept just start calling me saying, yeah, you want to talk about this? Okay, sure. And how do you feel about being like a public figure? I saw somewhere that you're referred to as the godfather of flat earth. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the life, the drugs, the sex, the, the, you know, people hounding me, you know, get away from me, you vultures. I said no autographs. No, no, nothing like that. No, be, because because of the topic, right? So <laughs> do you really want to be semi-famous for, you know, standing your ground when it comes to flat earth? <laughs> of, all the, of all the things, people say, oh, you're just in it for the money. It's like, do you really think I came with this idea? You know what would be a great money-making idea? Talking about flat earth. That'd be awesome. No. No. I I, I take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I will tell you this. Over the last six years, I have learned more about the media community than I had in my entire life. I've talked to so many producers, so many um, field producers, as a matter of fact, that I've learned a lot about how things work and, and um, you know, how different groups steal from each other. You know, there's lots of people that, you know, that don't know that the reason you become somewhat popular is everything's interconnected. This big spider web where there are producers that watch other shows. They say, who's, who's he have on? Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, again, that's, you'll, you'll see in the documentary, the reason why I got as many interviews as I did is that producers are lazy more than anything else they're, they're like oh we need a topic and then someone oh yeah i heard such and such talking about flat earth and then they'll listen to an interview that i did on something else for maybe 10 minutes i've heard the story over and over and then they'll say yeah he's fine get him on <laughs> and that's it i i didn't i didn't have to really do much at all which is why i feel bad for um uh, matt the, the the guy the the canadian guy that i listened to because he was, he was just so aloof. And he's like, no, I don't want to talk to media. And by the time he wanted to talk to media, it was too late. Because once you become that go-to guy, that go-to guy, it's, you're, you're that guy. Um, kind of like, um, I don't want to pick on him too much because I, I picked him in the book, was Bill Nye. Bill, Bill Nye was, was it's like, once he did, once some producer figured out we could, you could put him on as an interview and talk about science stuff, even though he's not a scientist, um, and it worked, you know, when, you know, especially with social media, you can say, oh yeah, it works. They just went with him. He gets to talk about all sorts of stuff. Goes to the White House, sits on panels, <laughs> scientific, full-blown quantum physics panels. It's like, what are you doing? I, I knew, I, I only rag on him so much because he was an actor from Seattle. I, I grew up with this guy. I mean, you know, he was in a local comedy troupe that did this local comedy show. And I knew exactly when, where Bill Nye, the science guy was born. He was, you know, the producer, the producer at the time, um, Ross Schaefer said, yeah, you know what? You kind of have, you're thin, you're got angular features. Let's put a lab coat on you. You can, you can joke about science. And then Disney's like, well, he's not swearing. He looks the part. <laughs> Let's franchise it. 
brilliant. Sorry. Um, so is this, you know, like mobilizing the flat earth message, is this your full-time employment? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I was one of the few people that actually could say that. Um, again, because I was getting, I was getting asked to do stuff that I would have, the flat earth would, you know, no, no one would have, let's put it this way. I was getting sol unsolicited calls from, again, well, again, the commercial had almost happened. But just before that, and they didn't even know, I did a, um, a commercial down in Australia for a mobile company down there. They, they were doing a, um, a theme, a campaign called um, Foolproof. Yeah. So, you know, if, if this person can use it, then any, anyone can use it. And so I was down there talking about flat earth. You know, it's like, you know, so easy, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, public speaking engagements and conferences and really cool. So yeah, I got, I mean, it didn't make a lot of money. I, I think it was on the verge of doing something and there's still producers out there fishing. There's one from A&E that's been fishing. I can't, I lost count of the networks that have talked about you know, trying to turn this into a TV show. Um, but yeah, it has, it, I, one of the few people that actually turned it into something, you know, that could uh, sustain me. And you mentioned previously that, you know, it's not, you're not doing this for the money. So what does motivate you to continue mobilizing? The, the reason I keep doing it, there's a couple, well, there's several reasons, but the, the big one is, is that it resonates. I've seen what, how it resonates with people. I've seen the, what, how it changes people's lives because it's the only conspiracy I know that motivate that, that gets people thinking about the big question that we always think about when we're young even younger than you which is um why are we here what's my purpose what why what is the meaning of life type thing and no flat earth doesn't have all the answers but it gets you closer a lot closer because then you're shrinking the universe down to a very very small place and if it was built by someone in this you know turn turn the universe into a studio apartment well, then there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. And that has, I mean, I've gotten so many emails over the last six years of, of from people saying, yeah, you know, I, I wasn't into spirituality. I wasn't, you know, I, I, I was wondering why I was even getting up in the morning. And Flat Earth gave me hope. And I know that some of that sounds quasi-religious, but uh, call it what it is. I mean, we've we use a lot of those terms, even though we don't have a Bible and we uh, don't really have a church and robes and chanting or anything like that. We are, um, you know, a lot of it is on faith. So. Would you say that the flat Earth message gives you hope? Yeah, yeah, and and forgive me because I don't remember everything I put in the book because I, I wrote it some. Um, you know, was that twenty nineteen? Yeah, twenty nineteen. Well, last year it was a blur. Um, they give me hope because I was I was the the quintessential naive rural backwater <laughs> kid who didn't even know there was another religion besides Christianity until I even got to university. It's like what is happening? And then once I get into tech because I loved it so much, I was a huge you know lifelong gamer. Uh, once I got into that the um that you, you go into tech deep enough you will fall away from any sort of spirituality because you're you're tech you, it kind of goes along with science but i yeah i didn't go to church for years and years and years and years decades i still don't but once i got into flat earth it snapped me back into a certain a different gear of spirituality and i've heard this from a lot of people where they've said yeah yeah, just because, again, the the nature of it. If it is a, if it is a structure, if it is a building, then it was built by someone, and then really you only have two options: either an advanced civilization that's much older and more powerful than ourselves, or some sort of deity. Well, at that point, you're kind of splitting hairs, aren't you? Because one man's advanced civilization is another man's god, and so yeah, yeah, it gives me hope too. Yeah, no, no question. No question. Do I, do I absolutely any, I've heard this and I, I will, I will parrot this, this things I've heard from other people, which is people that were 90% sure that there was a creator, 95% are now 98% or 99% sure that there is some sort of creator. Now, again, how you want to define that, 
take your pick. That's more of a regional thing. But uh, yeah, it's it's a wonderful hope message for me as well. And so what is your overall belief system? So the earth is flat. What about yeah. gravity, planets, time zones? What's your... Okay, short versions for all those. You are living literally in a building. It's probably squared off at the edges. What's outside it? No idea. I've got some, well, I do have some ideas. But what's inside it is everything that you see. So when you're looking up at the planets, you're, you're basically in a giant planetarium. And that's the opening line, of course, for the, the movie which is, and I know this kind of dates me and you're not old enough to even go to a planetarium. It's like, oh, that's for old people. But planetarium is, you know, you think, you know, if you've ever been in one, you take the seats out or, and put a few that are you know, horizontal and you lay on the back and you stare at star constellations and planets that are on the ceiling. And I throw this at people. I say, okay, do you see Jupiter inside that planetarium? And they say, yes, I do. And I go, okay, can you land on it? No, I can't. Why not? Well, because it's just a light on the ceiling. And that's my point. The point is when you walk out of that building, who's to say you're just not in a much, much bigger planetarium. So everything that you see in the sky is just a giant ornate clock system that predates language. That's all it is. It's, it's just, it's a very, very pretty clock. That's it. A very, very big clock as far as, you know, what it can do. It doesn't, it's not just hours of the day. It's all sorts of fun stuff. As far as gravity, I throw back at people, and again, forgive me because I can't remember if I put this in the book. I might have, though, where um, you, you can ask any scientist, ask any of your science students, you say, what is gravity? And they'll just, they'll give you all sorts of jumble. The truth is they don't know. Uh, the, your best scientists will say, yeah, we don't know what gravity is. We can only tell you what it does. We can only tell you its symptoms. You, know, you drop something, it falls to the floor. Well, what is that? Well, it's some magical molecular force that's pulling things to the center of a sphere. And we say, well... It's a magical molecular force that's pulling things straight down. That, and of course, density and buoyancy. Meaning, if you're in a building, or let's say it's a snow globe, you're in a pressurized system, which makes so much more sense. Meaning, it is, it is pressure, pressurized in layers. So things that are lighter, you know, less dense rise, and things that are heavier fall. Um, and, and that leads into a whole other thing, which... I know it's, it's not one of your original questions, which is gravity versus the vacuum of space. No, no scientist has ever come at me with an answer to this, which is if you know thermodynamics at all, which is okay, thermodynamics says that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without some sort of barrier. It's the way it works. It's why when you blow a balloon up and you let it go, a million times out of a million times, it will always just fly off because the pressure is going to equalize. But that bladder around the outside, that was the barrier. And if you took your second floor of your building, you know, and turned it into a vacuum chamber, you have a valve right above you, pulled it, it's going to equalize very, very quickly, violently, as a matter of fact, and you probably black out. I don't think you'll die, but you might, but it's not like the movies. So the question is, why didn't the gravity in your room keep the air in your room instead of going upstairs? Well, because the vacuum will win every time. That's a problem because when you go outside, why is the giant pure vacuum of space not shredding our atmosphere? And your initial knee-jerk reaction will always be, and rightly so, it will be gravity. You'll say, well, it's because of gravity. I go, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room? That gravity? And then you're going to, then you'll have to wrestle with it. You're going, um, well, there must be some sort of, well, because of compound, maybe there's more. I had a guy say, well, there's more gravity outside. I was going, no, no, it's not more gravity. It's the same, same gravity. Um, what was the other one you had? Uh, time zones. Oh, yeah, time zones. Time zones. Uh, I feel bad because there were some things that we... I don't think there was a solution for this. Meaning when we started drawing and doing the computer graphics for this, the sun... Sorry, let me back up. The sun and the moon are very, very small and very, very close. So they'd be less than 50 miles wide and 3,000 miles high, give or take. The problem with that is that they are so small is that you can't draw them on anything. So if you're drawing the world to scale, even the flat world, the sun would be so small, it'd be smaller than a pixel uh, you know, if, you're, if you're using Photoshop or whatever. The problem is, is you're showing people, it's like, where's the sun and the moon? By the time you're done drawing to where they can see it, it's about a thousand miles wide. 
And then the question will be like, well, we is in the sun shining on everything simultaneously. It's like, no, no, it's not. That's not really how big the sun would be. The only reason the sun's that big is because we have to show you where it is. But the sun would be just tiny, 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 tiny going around the outside, which means it wouldn't light up everything, which means the time zones are not a problem. That and the thickness of the atmosphere, which I love so much. Meaning the, when you see the sun set, I can show you some videos, hell, they're on my channel. The sun isn't setting. It's just fading out into nothing. Because remember, what we're talking through right now, this stuff we're breathing, we're not even really walking through life. We're swimming. People don't get that. It's like we're really, you're just existing in like a thin version of water. Most of what you're breathing in right now is nitrogen. 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Throw the trace gases out for, for now, just to make it easy. Which means it has a thickness. Which means over distance, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker to where the sun appears to set, but it doesn't. In fact, HD technology has changed that to where you zoom in, the sun will pop back up, but eventually it's going to go away because the atmosphere gets too thick. But the other, the better example would be for, for those who may not get this is scuba divers will do this all the time. They'll say even at 200 feet down, if you're scuba diving, it doesn't matter. You it could be a beautiful high noon summer sun. You will not see it. Why? Because it can't penetrate that much water. Why not? Well, it's just the thickness of how it is. We're just in a thinner version of that. So that kind of help, kind of. So, you know, you if you say this to people, how do you back it up with evidence? What experiments have you done? Or Oh, good Lord. Um, depends what we're, which one we're talking about here. Gravity, we don't really have to do anything because it's a push. You know, we say gravity is about the same thing you guys say gravity is. Um, when it comes to the sun and or time zones and all that stuff, we just use, we've done, the first thing, the, the biggest thing we have, if you want to ask the, the, the biggest proof, thing, thing that I didn't, it's not even in the clues. People just did this on their own. I was stunned, was long distance photography, which was, they said, and we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of, of long distance photography. In fact, the, the first video, um, I don't know if I sent it to you, it was in my, in my experiments playlist, it's brilliant. But they started shooting, everyone started running out to bodies of water with HD cameras and shooting anything they could over long distances over bodies of water, everything from boats to lighthouses to um, oil rigs, you take a pick, they're all out there. And you say, why would they do this? And why did this convince so many people? Why are there so many people into this? Well, this is, this is what it does. The curvature of the earth, we didn't come up with it, is eight inches per mile per mile, which is otherwise known as eight inches per mile squared. I know and I forgot everything I learned about in algebra. I had to relook this up and figure out what the hell it was doing, which means when you look at something off the distance, let's say 10 miles, 10 miles is 10 times 10, which is 100 times eight inches, which is 800 inches. And then that just keeps getting more and more severe to where when you get up to like 50 miles, you're pushing 1700 feet which means anything that far off should be 1,700 feet over the other side of the hill, which means anything less than 1,700 feet in height, you shouldn't even be able to see at all. And people were shooting amazing, depending on the weather conditions, because remember, this is the soup we're talking about. We're shooting amazing stuff all over the place. And that's, I mean, again, this was not part of the clues. I didn't, never came up with the idea on my own. The, everyone just sim like simultaneously did this because water lays perfectly level. So, and it you know, would cover, would hug the curvature of the earth if you're leaving the curve. And so that was the big thing that people were shooting. Then you had the people who were duplicating stuff with lasers because lasers fire perfectly straight. And if you have a def decent enough condenser, you could shoot a laser. And if you had somebody on the other end, could they see it? Because other people say, oh, refraction is going to stop, you know, photography. It's like, fine, we'll shoot lasers at night. And we did that and that worked. Um, but the big thing that got people was the, um, the subject matter experts from the, that called me up again, unsolicited from all branches of the military and air traffic controllers and um, pilots you name it, they were all, the, the military guys were fascinating though, because they were saying, yeah, we never factor in the curvature of the earth or the spin of the earth into any firing solution ever. And yet mainstream will drag on a sniper every once in a while and said, oh yeah, I've shot so far a mile that I had to, I had to take into account the curvature and the spin of the earth. Right. And then the, the, um, 
the artillery guys who shoot 30 miles and missile guys shoot 50 miles and, and sub guys and all the other guys, they're calling me up saying, no, 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 no. We don't factor any of that stuff in. He goes, you know how hard war would be if we had to factor in all these, you know, the, the shell we had, because remember the spin of the earth also depends if you believe in the globe on where you are. So if you're on the equator, it's supposedly spinning a thousand miles an hour. If you're on the North pole or the South pole, it's spinning at zero miles an hour. And then everywhere in between, it could be 400, 700, 900, whatever. It just never, ever happens. So you combine a lot of those things that people were coming at us with. And again, reasonable doubt more than anything wins the day. Um, I probably said this in the book, which was, can I prove to you right now that the earth is flat? No, if I, if I could, I'd be a cover of all sorts or I'd be dead. Um, but can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the, the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model? Yeah, I can. I can do that all day long. And you say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough in science. I go, mm, maybe not in science, but for the general public, it is. Reasonable doubt wins court cases every hour of every day. Any of that help? Sort of? No, uh, that's a good, I'm glad you brought that statement because I highlighted that in uh, the book about reasonable doubt and you can't prove it 100%. I thought that was a interesting statement. Well, it, it is, you know, it's, it's, but it's true. I mean, there's, it's, there people, I've had science, science people come at me and say, well, it's all circumstantial. I go, yeah, but it adds up. I go, there's more holes in the, the problem. The problem with the globe thing is that everyone in the flat earth community starts out trying, nobody, nobody likes flat earth to start with. Everybody hates it. And everyone, everyone is a globalist. And that's what we call them anyway. And they, they say, well, okay, I can prove the globe. Here's why. And the more they, they it's like, it's on scales. Again, the court, court reference. And after a while, there's more whole plot holes because uh, I'm a big writer, plot hole guy. I love media and I love stories. Stories are, are the big thing. But there's more holes in the globe than there are in the flat earth. Way more. And once people finally figure that out, there's this big shift to where, and I've, I've heard this so many times over the years, which is they, they, they go, holy crap. Same thing that happened to me where it's like you all of a sudden flip and you're like, oh my God, I don't believe in the globe anymore. And then you, you start going, oh, what has happened to me? Because you can't go back. It's very um, matrixy. Whereas once, once you flip, you can't go back. And I think I, this is in the documentary because you were the one that tore down the globe in the first place. That's the genius of this whole thing. We don't, I'm not going to convince you. I'm not going to persuade you, but I'm just going to put a couple ideas in your head. You figure it out for yourself. But if you are the one that tears down the globe, you tear it down and then you have buyer's remorse later. Tough. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're the one that did it. You can't re-put it. It's a Humpty Dumpty thing. You can't put this thing back together because you were the one that convinced yourself. It wasn't like you could pin it on one person. It's like, well, I just don't believe that person anymore because it wasn't about him or her. It was about you. And you mentioned the book, this is just a quick statement about how you used to have globes all over your room. Oh my God. <laughs> Of all the people that shouldn't have believed in this, it shouldn't have been me. I was a huge fan of maps. I used to collect antique globes. I used to buy them on eBay from schools. You know, you know, take them off the spindle, figure out what to do with them. I mean, I must have had 75% of the walls in my condo were covered by some sort of map, including world maps. And I joked with people because it was like, why, Mark, why do you have all the maps? I go, well... You know, I like the big picture sort of concept, but also if I suffer a head injury, when I, if I wake up, I know where I, where I am, right? It's like, it's like, oh, hey, look, this is where you are. I mean, this is your world. I, I love that statement. This is your world. And so when this happened, it was a big blow because I was, all of a sudden they became, you become hyper aware of the imagery. It's stunning to me. I got to throw this in there real quick because it is conspiracy, in my opinion. The silent producers that are out there. You, if you, if you look for it, and I don't know how much television or movies you watch, you will see globes in just about every major production since, oh God, since the 80s. And, and, and some stuff makes sense. It's fine, a school classroom, I get it, a globe. 
Why is it in that doctor's office? Why is it in that billionaire's office? Why isn't that detective's office? I don't know how many crime shows I have watched where on top of, you know, you got a, you know, the, the messy detective, you know, his office on top of a filing cabinet is a freaking globe. What's it doing up there? <laughs> it has nothing to do with the show, but it's so subtle that people don't, don't notice it. It's subliminal. It's brilliant. I don't know how, how that started. You combine that with um, the, all the movies that, you know, that we've done and, of course, NASA. And, again, people believed it. It, there, it was no accident, by the way. Let's get into another conspiracy real fast. No accident that 2001 A Space Odyssey, best picture of the year, by the way, in 1968, was released one year before the Apollo landing. Was, there was no accident. People fill in the blanks with things that they see. You know, they make huge assumptions. You, you can tell people about, you know, well, if you punch a hole in the side of your capsule, how much air do you have? Well, it's like, oh, you'll have like four minutes, five minutes. Like, no, you have no minutes. <laughs> it's, it's a fraction of a second. It's over. But the movies have, have done this so many times for dramatic license that they've gotten away with it. That and many other things. Do you have disc of the Earth? Like, a well, have, Oh, I mean, what it looks like? Yeah, or do you just have those around your house now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not on the walls, but like, yeah, like in this drawer right here. You got one? Oh, nice. Mostly, mostly for interviews. So like on this one, um, Chris Pontius, the guy from the documentary, made this one for me. It's kind of like a trivet little thing. But yeah. uh, the, the, it'd be like the satellite version on top and then the bat version at the bottom. Um, oh, a company in Italy that makes coins... They made me a, um, they made me one of these. This is kind of fun. Oh yeah, that's fun. Yeah. And that's a, it's a two ounce silver coin on the back. And they decided to do the cons a conspiracy series of all things. In fact, it's called, um, you know, I'll show you real fast. It's called, yeah, Great Conspiracies. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And this was the first one they did. That was the first one they chose was the, um, was the flat earth. And I would take that, I would take this one with me to, um, uh conferences and they sold these god like 300 euros something like that ridiculous because it's silver and it's custom made and it's like whatever so i don't i don't loan that one out if i can help it so in one of your previous answers you were saying like for the experiments you kept saying we so how i'm just curious about the flat earth like community and it's like how big it is because I feel like I've been deep diving for the last couple of oh geez about it and it's like the forums have millions and millions of discussions it is massive it is it is absolutely it is the weirdest community ever because 90 percent of them are in the closet it's like the gay community only worse <laughs> meaning at least the gay community is half in half out but in the Flyers community, it's 90% in. They do not want, and why would they? I mean, friends, family, coworkers. Um, I have talked to celebrities. <laughs> I have talked to captains of industry. I have talked to all sorts of fun people and just about every profession you can think of. And so many of them won't come out because they're afraid. Mostly it's the, it's the work thing. You know, the, um, uh, the, like within the celebrity circles, the thing that got him most was uh, Kyrie Irving, which I think I, who I think I mentioned in the book, the basketball player, um, after he won his championship, there's a perfect example. Top of the world, what was he, 25? Uh, you know, friends with LeBron James, just won his title. He's going to the All Star game. He does a podcast on the plane and they bait him. You know, because they knew him. It was a, it was a bas another basketball player. And he's going, yeah, I'm totally into flat earth, blah, blah, blah. Here's why. What do you think happens? He lands media days the next day. <laughs> they raked him over the coals to where like USA Today was like berating him, saying, you can't talk about this. He goes, you are, you are an inspiration to kids. You shouldn't be doing this. Um, in fact, a year later, I'll give you a quick example. A year later... Kyrie's in a Fortune Fortune magazine, 30 under 30, you know, 30 most influential people under 30 years old. And he was apologizing to, this will give you an example of the influence celebrities have. He was apologizing to all the inner city science teachers because what was happening was 
they were you know saying, oh yeah, by the way, the world's a globe, blah blah blah. And the kid, you know, kid raised hands like, yeah, yeah, my man Kyrie, who's got his own shoe line, and he made ten million dollars last year. He says it's flat. What do you do, <laughs> right? And they were getting huge pushback. And so um, he he apologized. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But you know, what can I tell you? Um, but the community itself is is amazing. It's extremely positive, extremely dedicated, um, and they're everywhere. It is, uh, I have, you run into people, I have run into the weirdest thing. I've run people, you know, even on this island, you know, drugstore, car wash, you know, people will see me. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, man, I'm totally into this, right? Never heard from the, you know, seeing this guy, I, the, the listeners to my podcast, I have people who have been listening for years, never call in because they don't want people to know that think that they recognize their voice. I have my own, my own family. I've got cousins that will not, will not come out because they're like, yeah, I can't, can't do it. Um, in the book thing you read, um, uh, the, the weirdest thing I, you know, that I heard when I was out there was the, um, that celebrities were talking about the Oscars a couple of years ago. And they, but it's like, no, you know, you can't, it's still too dicey. To where you know Jimmy Kimmel was punking us on the uh, at our conference in Dallas, you know. So it's how many are there? Millions, millions and millions. How, I, God only knows. But what's weird is if you go into like YouTube, I check this every so often. You go to YouTube and you say, "Show me the flat Earth video." You know, flat Earth sort by week. You know, last week. So many people. The the virus actually helped us in some ways because it kept people at home. You know, you know, a lot more people got into conspiracies because they were they were trapped. You know, after they ran out of things to look at at Netflix, or they were just tired watching movies. So, you're saying that flat earthers, it's more common. So, I probably, you know, know someone or an acquaintance of somebody. You absolutely, know people. Yeah. But 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 how would you know? It's not like you know we got the hand signal, sure. But that's about that's about it. You know, we don't wear any special emblems or pins. It's not like Hunger Games or anything like that. We we don't nobody advertises, so you don't know. But one in fact I've had I've had family members from you know, people have told me like family members, like great story was brothers, where these two brothers <laughs> were like one of them came, it's like, Yeah, dude, you know what I'm looking into now? He goes, Tell me it's not flat earth. It's like it is flat earth. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's awesome. I, I love that part of it, but it's 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 bittersweet because it's a secret thing, but it's a cool secret thing. And again, it's not it's not a dark conspiracy. The reason why we weren't hammered on like you know the all the major media things are going after you know certain different conspiracies, is because there's not a sinister aspect to it. Oh yeah, there's people that lying, but we didn't they didn't build it. You know they're just trying to keep the secret. So which is why there's so many women in it. You know women women don't like dark awful things you know they they don't they like you know they like some sort of silver lining and so many of them said oh yeah the, the message of hope totally dig that totally into it and so how has you know being open about your belief affected your you know just personal life with friends and family really varies um there was a rift between my sister and I for quite some time because they wanted her like for the documentary and she wouldn't do it. And we actually shot a couple scenes in front of her house. <laughs> didn't while she was gone. Didn't well, we didn't think nobody does. You don't think a documentary is actually no, nothing's going to happen. I mean, anyone will tell you it's like the, the chances of your documentary and I didn't make it. Um, chances of any documentary making it out there are slim to none. Um, but. I have made a lot of new friends. I haven't really lost that many friends. As a matter of fact, I was, I was trying to keep under the radar when it came to the internet for a while. I did not post much. And um, this was shared by enough that I reconnected with a whole bunch of people that I knew from school. The, when, I left, when I left high school and went and did my own thing, I was doing my own thing. I mean, I was off in Colorado. I didn't even look back. But now uh, I've had people that I hadn't talked to in 20, sometimes 30 years getting a hold of me. And you mentioned that 
the flat earth like society and you know belief system um people like it because it's not like sinister undertones to it but right. what do you say to people that since misinformation and spreading you know quote unquote fake news is such mm-hmm. a large problem what do you say to those who are you know assume that you're spreading lies I would say that we're the least of your problems when it comes to misinformation. That's the short, blunt answer. You got bigger fish to fry than uh, than Flat Earth, which is why when Congress convened and, or it was a special session, but it was televised, and they talked about three things. They were talking about fake news and misinformation. They talked about false flags, that they were cracking down on three things. And this was you know the, the reps from Google and YouTube. Um, False flags, snake oil, you know, and, you know, it's cure all, buy this pill, and flat earth. Out of all the topics they could have brought up, they only brought up three, and we were in there. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to censor, we're going to go after and knock out all false flags, and we're going to knock out all snake oil. But it was interesting, when they got to us, I don't know why, I know why, and I'll tell you in a second. When it got to us, they said, you know, we're going to recommend flat earth less. We're like, okay, why, why would you give us a, you know, it seems like a barely a slap on the wrist. Why, why even do that? The reason was, is because, and media is consistent, is that we were, you, people can say, oh yeah, fake news and, and all this, but if it is binge worthy, they're keeping it. Meaning controversial things on Netflix are controversial, but they will leave them up there until the negatives outweigh the positives. So when it came to us, uh, there was this great guy. In fact, if you haven't watched it, uh, really, um, there's a great Netflix documentary called um, The Social Dilemma. Mm-hmm. And there's a programmer on there who mentioned us before. And we were mentioned that like five different times in that movie, which was weird because you know they were talking about how they built this social network and how it's now become this Frankenstein monster, which is just trampling everything across the countryside. And this guy... He didn't say it in the show, but I, he had said it before. And I recognized him as soon as he popped up the screen. I was going, oh, wow, that guy. And they asked him why things get recommended to you on the right-hand side, right? You know, recommended for you in YouTube. And he goes, remember, think of how many topics are on YouTube. Tens of thousands of topics. He brings up one. You know what it is? <laughs> he, says, he says, well, if the average person that gets into Flat Earth watches 20 videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? Which means people, I don't know why. I have been trying to coin this for a while now. It's like, look, YouTube is the biggest television network in the world. No one talks about it. There's all oh, Netflix and HBO Max and Disney Plus. And I was like, are you kidding? Every minute of every day, 80 hours of content gets uploaded to YouTube. Every minute. <laughs> Lifetime's worth. Now, granted, a lot of it is silly and, and awful. But... There's still tons and tons and tons, and it's very niche-based. So when it comes to people saying, oh, no, it's fake news, we should do something about it. It's like, okay, why did YouTube promote us nonstop for three years? Nonstop. I mean, we were getting complaints that people were getting recommended Flat Earth videos for nothing. (laughs) I mean, it's like, yeah, conspiracy videos, Flat Earth recommended for you, potato salad recipe. Oh, here's three Flat Earth videos, tractor maintenance. We were just to where people were complaining. It's like, look, I don't want to see anymore. We saturated that. So people want to talk about misinformation and, and all that. It's like, all right, fine. But you got, they, there are so many people in line ahead of us. Why would you even, why would you even bother with flat earth? Right? It's silly. Why would you even, you have to take it seriously to address it. You know what I mean? That's what caught a lot of them off guard. Meaning who is it damaged? We've never had a violent outburst. We've never had anyone, scream flat earth and run into a building and blow something up. In fact, we've never even had anyone punch anybody. The, the closest we had was one of our guys accosted, I think, an astronaut in a Starbucks. And he, and he was just, you know, pointing his finger. And yelling. It's like, you know, but I, you know, find me, find me a, a, a kid. And we've had a lot of kids. Heck, I've done middle schools <laughs> to where you find me where it's a detriment, where the open-minded, you know, being open-minded about something hurts somebody. Again, we're not, we're not saying that this is what makes us different than other conspiracies. We're not going in saying there's a black hat over there doing awful things, twirling his handlebar mustache, and you should really not listen to them ever. We don't say, you know, 
overthrow the government. We don't say that. We say, you know what? Take everything you hear with a grain of salt. Don't think for a second that people in authority won't bend the truth. What's, what's the, the so many lines? Um, I know Mark Twain didn't say it, but he gets credit for it. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Meaning, and here's, here's the other thing, which is, let's boil this down, which is there are conspiracies that are sanctioned which we don't call conspiracies, and there's conspiracies that aren't sanctioned. When the media latches on to, there's a, but it's like state approved conspiracies, which you take the name off. So if it has anything to do with money, it's a scandal, or sex, it's a scandal. If somebody dies, it's a tragedy. But if it's outside the boundaries, then it becomes a conspiracy. It's just depends. There's this imaginary line in the sand. You've got one too, which is things you're willing to look at in your wheelhouse and things outside. We all know full well there are secrets and conspiracies in business and politics and sports and entertainment. And yes, even journalism and science. We, they're out there. And people, you have, I'm waiting for someone in the journalism field to say, there's nothing in journalism. I go, really? <laughs> <laughs> how many names do I have to bring up before you like backpedal on that? Like, didn't Bill O'Reilly have a show? What, what happened to Matt Lauer? Yeah, what happened to Brian Williams? That ah, doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is, is that th we all know they're out there, but what's what you're willing to look at. And so when we come at them, we say, look, maybe this is something that, that, that might interest you. Uh, there's an old, sorry, I know I ramble and you can stop me, <laughs> which is, there's an old saying, which is trust everyone, but count your change, which is because if, pe if you are taken for granted, if people think that, again, that, that you, you will believe anything that a certain group says, they will take advantage of that. Uh, science is no exception, no exception whatsoever. Most of the time, they bend the rules for money, for quarterly profits. Uh, look, scientists need Porsches too. And they do, and they will take the money and they will absolutely break, break the rules because look, we need to get this product out or we won't have a company anymore. And then it's like, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And let's, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And sometimes science gets it really, really, really wrong, really wrong. And so, and again, and I could, I could send you stuff. You want to look up some fun stuff and maybe I'll, I'll send you some slides. Look, my two, two favorite examples I'll give you. One is the coelacanth fish, which I can't remember who was in the book. Coelacanth fish, uh, C O E L A N C. You, you'll be able to find it. Coelacanth fish. Dead, extinct, 75 million years, absolutely gone forever. Until they found one off the beach in 1940. The, the British government got it. And then another one off of Madagascar and one off of Mozambique. And now the National Geographic finally ended up swimming with them. Okay, every scientist before that point, right up to the day that fish was caught, would have bet the freaking farm that it was gone forever. So it's a, what I like saying is science is only right until they're not. I mean, you know, everything is a myth. Everything, you know, we are, it's our stamp of science. It drives me nuts, especially with cryptozoology. You know, like, like the giant panda is an absolute myth. Okay, uh, the giant anaconda is an absolute myth. Uh, the giant squid, I could go on. Every Unless they actually see it and put it in a lab for themselves, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It's a fairy tale. Drives me nuts. And then you got guys like, oh, no, uh, Kelvin. You know, the absolute temperature is based on his name, Kelvin. Uh, Lord William Kelvin, I believe. You know, he's famous for that, right? So his name is used every day in every university. Kelvin, right? Absolute zero. You know what else he's famous for? He's famous for saying that airplanes will never happen. Never, ever. I don't have any faith in the aeronautical society at all. And it's not like he was saying this back in the 1600s. He was saying this as they were building them. And they were flying before he died. But he was on record saying, nope, they will absolutely not happen. And it's like, you're the father of thermodynamics. <laughs> what the hell? Why would, you, why would you take that leap? And, you know, they... Sometimes they just go off the freaking rails. Sorry, what else can I do for you? Um, so how do you reply to people who say, why would NASA be lying to us? Or have you never seen a picture of, you know, space? <laughs> okay. 
for you. Let's see, can we share stuff? Chat, share screen, chat. I think I can dump this in chat. One second. For anyone that ever says that, well, there's so many things. I know you're you're kind of getting late into the game here. Um, let's do here. Here, by the way, here's the like. Can I? That's the coelacanth fish, by the way. Thank you. This is a great shot from Apollo ten. No, Apollo twelve. Apollo twelve. Oh yeah. And by the way, this is a. Uh, do you play tennis at all? Do you know anything about tennis? A little bit, yeah. You know who Novak is? A bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Here's a picture of him holding up a flat Earth sign of ours. No one talks to him. You know why? Because he didn't say it. He just held up that picture and tweeted it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about that, by the way, a little inside scoop, he didn't draw that picture. You know who drew it? His daughter. <laughs> Which means he's passing it down. Uh, okay, so can you open up that, um, that Apollo shot real fast for me? Yep. Oh, and by the way, here, I'll also... I'll dump some, you can, you can get all these, right? Yep. Okay, good. Here, I'll show you what, like, what we were doing in 2019, give you an idea of how much feathers we were rustling. Here is the copy, here's the cover of Popular Science. Here's the cover of Newsweek. Here's the cover of Skeptic. Oh, we were, we were rocking it in 2019. We could do, we could do no wrong. And the, uh, Here's the, uh, of course, the behind the curve and so on and so on. Okay, so that shot from Apollo, here's a great example. You see the, do you have the, the moon shot open? Yeah. Okay. Anyone says, there, there's two things I could give you, but we'll do this first. We'll do the moon thing first and then I'll say, because um, you're going to come back and say, well, no, people have seen the courage from an airplane, right? I've had thousands of people say that. We'll get to that. So this is date and time stamp. This is straight from NASA. Nothing special here. Looks really nice photograph. I mean, it's HD, beautiful shot. The longer you stare at it, the worse it gets. Because if you know anything about science, there's certain things that are completely screwed up. First and foremost, because it was, it was shot by an advertising. This is a studio. You were looking at a complete studio shot. This was set up somewhere. It's a beautiful shot. I don't know what advertising firm was, was take, brought in for this. But because the average person, when they get out of school, remember, we only educate people just enough to where they can like drive. <laughs> if you don't make it to university, you don't know anything about chemistry or physics or engineering or biology or virology or name it. Okay, real fast. Uh, if you go outside, I don't know if it's a sunny day where you are, but um, all these shadows will run parallel. That's what happens. One big light source, 93 million miles away, all the shadows run parallel. They will never intersect. They will always run in exactly one direction. Uh, something we are taught when we're young and we forget it almost immediately. Well, that doesn't really work well in this shot at all because we've got shadows running at least four directions, very prominent, and that would only happen if the light source was very, very close, like a giant hotspot studio light, maybe 30 yards behind that guy. Number two, footprints everywhere. Lots of nice footprints. The ash, by the way, is perfectly like three, four inches deep all over uniform. No one ever talks about that, that no one ever takes a shovel. It's like, wow, why is the ash so perfectly layered? Footprints everywhere, but that's not what I want you to look at. What I want you to look at is underneath the capsule because that's a big rocket nozzle there with about 10,000 pounds of thrust engine. There's no splay pattern at all. In fact, there's footprints right next to it. How? Why is there no splay pattern? Why is the ash not disturbed underneath this rocket nozzle? It's impossible. Can't happen. Let's look at engineering. That satellite dish right there, that's a VHF transmitter that is not classified in any way, shape, or form. You can look up the model number as 1969. It runs off a car battery. It's got no power at all. It's got maybe a range on a good day of 50 miles. And that's Morse code. And yet... They just told people, it's like, oh, yeah, that thing's broadcasting 10 frames of color video a second in 1969, plus perfect two-way communication to the Earth with no snow, no static, no break up at all. Perfect communication. How are you lining this thing up in 1969? What power source? Every radio station person in the world will tell you the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, it's all about wattage. 50,000 watts, maybe you'll get you part of the state. 
but you're not going to cross a quarter million miles through space through the Van Allen radiation belt. It's not going to happen. But again, because the dish is there, it's like, oh, that's how they communicated. Oh, God, the spacesuit doesn't make any sense. That's the vacuum part, which we go into in a later time. Um, of course, no stars in the background, but that was a brilliant move on their part because had they done the stars, we wouldn't even be talking right now. The whole thing would be debunked in instantly. The reason why you don't have any stars is because of nerds. Not necessarily me, but like qualified, you know, Neo Maxi Zoom dweeby nerds, which is all it takes. Remember, this is time stamped. Or date stamp down at the bottom. So if the belt of Orion is behind them and it's over here somewhere, well, the belt of Orion better be in the right place <laughs> from a three-dimensional standpoint because if it's not, you're going to have a problem. How are you going to line that all that up in 1969? You don't have computers to do that. We'd, we'd have a tough time doing that now. So they just said, black it out. And I know people say, oh, it's an exposure of the film thing. And I keep hearing this over and over. It's an exposure setting. That's going, okay, fine. So wouldn't you ever be able to see them ever? Did the human eye not be able to see them? Can't, wasn't there an exposure setting? You couldn't have run one roll of film to show what the stars, the stars should have been stunning. Nope, nope, never, never run it. But anyway, those three things, by the way, no one has ever, ever, ever answered the question about the shadows. No, it, it will just racks. Most people in science will just deflect. They'll be like, well, what about this other thing? It's like, no one wants to talk about the shadows. That right there just blows the whole thing to hell cannot be done you cannot show that this this shot cannot happen unless you unless somebody claims time lapse it's like uh-huh time time lapse. Yeah, not gonna happen so anyway so anyone that says anything about space i throw up this shot just for the hell of it i mean that's that's just that's just a single shot i could show you the interior shots in the iss movie versions and videos all the time we, we destroyed that was the thing that really got them horrible because no one's paying attention to the iss especially in the 80s the 80s, even before the ISS, they were they were getting away with murder because no one cared. They have to run space stories to get the budget, but most people don't even care. It's like whatever. No one even talks about the fact that we have no one ever went back to the moon. By the way, Americans, that's that's 1969. No no one went back. Chinese didn't go. In India didn't go. Europe, Japan, Russia, no one went. There was a space race. You've probably heard of that. Remember, it was a space race. Yeah, United States, Soviet Union, back and forth, back and forth. The United States gets there, and then Soviet Union just quits. Just they just shut it down forever. Never. Wait, when does that happen in the history of sports? Uh, when it comes to people looking from plane, I will recommend. Sorry, let me see if I can find it for you real fast. Ba -ba -ba. What is that video? It is called. One sec. Let's see how far I can find it. It's called for those, it's been a few months now, so I've got a bunch up there. For those who say they've seen the curve, where are you? Uh, hang on, let me search real fast. I'll find it. This is something I highly recommend for people. One sec. Curve. There you are. For those of you who have seen the curve, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You don't have to watch the video now, but I highly recommend it. Um, put it on my channel. The uh, he so there was a Red Bull jump some years ago, and he the Red Bull jump. If you remember, they went up one hundred thirty thousand feet, and he jumped out world record for parachute jump but they used a fisheye lens to make it look like there was a severe curvature up there and neil degrasse tyson the most famous scientist in the world comes on stage during one of his things and he said yeah i just want to clarify that what red bull did was kind of scientifically dishonest because at one hundred thirty thousand feet there is no curvature at all and and he said he even mentioned the fisheye lens i mean he told to talk about this in front of thousands of people and so anyone that ever comes to me, because I've had people say, oh no, I've seen the curve for sure from an airplane. I've seen it from a, I've seen it from a mountaintop. I've seen it from the beach. I've seen the curvature. I go, really? Because that's the world's most famous scientist. And he says, you can't even see it from four times the height of an airplane. You can't see it. So what, and, and again, I'm not picking on people. This is where it gets kind of Orwellian. It's not that you see the curvature. You want, I think I said this in the book. You want to see the curvature. 
there's a big difference. And that is, it's just straight up conditioning. We have been told over and over and over and over and over again, there's curvature that when we look out in the distance, we see the curvature. It's the whole five lights, four lights thing, which is if you are told something over and over and over, eventually it starts to sink in, even if you don't see it. And I'm sure you've seen psychological experiments in, in school along those lines, where you can go out with a group of people, well, the ash experiment, a great one, get a group of people, you know, three, three control people and one actual test subject. And you have them like gauge the, the, the width of lines, length of, or width of lines. And they will all say, even though they, you can see full well that the line is, is what's the longest line on the screen, right? And they'll all say, oh, it's number one. It's actually number three. They'll all say number one. The person in the end will be like, yeah, it's number one. Why? Right? It's, it's a reinforcement. It's a powerful, powerful thing. What else can I? So sorry, I just keep thinking. No, 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 hit me. I don't I don't care. So, you know, there's you have this conception that NASA's and the government is lying to people. What about, you know, in kindergarten and first grade when my teacher is showing me a, the globe and saying this is what, you know, this is what the world looks like. What's See, the overall why not? Yeah. I mean, it's science doesn't like question marks. Building a universe with a solar system around and planets and a galaxy around that and a universe around that leaves nothing to chance. Meaning there are questions, it's sort of like the core of the earth thing, which you'll get into when you, if you actually watch the clues, which is when it comes to me in science, what can you, what is, there's what's known and what can be proven. So if you want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level, great. You know, I can test that myself. Get a pot of water, light that sucker up, put a temperature thing in there and test it out. Tell me what the core of the earth looks like. Oh, that's a problem. Because, you know, we've all seen the graphs. You know, we all know what they look like. You know, we've seen the bands, you know, red and orange and yellow and white. We know this molten center, blah, blah, blah. They made a movie about it. Boy, the deepest hole ever drilled. What do you think that is? Deepest hole ever drilled. Core of the earth supposedly 4,000 miles down. Half that? 2,000? 1,000? 100? 10 deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles, 12 kilometers. The Russians and the Germans tried for years to break the eight mile barrier. Could not do it. Could not do it for whatever reason. Didn't matter where they were drilling, they couldn't get past eight miles. And yet science will show us this wonderful cross section. Not only the cross section of our world, but like Saturn and Jupiter and all this other stuff. It's like, you can't even, you can't even go down a 10th of a percentage in our world. So why are you showing this? The reason is, is because science doesn't like putting question marks in anything. As a matter of fact, you, the globe should be a globe with a big question mark inside. They won't do that because they're science and they want to reassure people. It's like, this is what we think it is. In fact, but then they, then they take that word out, which is, this is what it is. It's not what we think it is. It's what it is. They take this massive leap of faith, which is what religion does. And they use it to their advantage. And then once they figured out that, oh, people are just buying it, they just start anything they wanted. If you're in a lab coat, you can put a stamp on anything and they will believe it. Um, I mean, look at the stuff that's out there. Dark matter. Look up dark matter sometime. There are guys that are, that are spending deck, you know, all their, their, their postgraduate careers doing, working on dark matter, assuming it's real. But the truth is they have no idea. Dark matter is just this name for something that's like, yeah, we don't know really what's happening out there. So we're just trying to, you know, just try to see if we can mathematically decipher it, see if we can untangle this. What was the original question? Um, just about, you know, the intention of... Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, you, there was the other thing, which was, again, you, which was in the clue. Why hide it? Was that mm -hmm. one, of, one of your questions? Why keep it a secret? Why would NASA lie? Some, some along those lines. <clears throat> the big reason is how civilizations evolve, meaning if you, we didn't even figure this out until 1960. And if 1960, I'll even put that to you. I know you're young, but if 1960, you figured this out as a journalist, you'd be like, well, the people have a right to know. They should be told this in 1960. Then you sit around in a meeting with all your peers and, and you say, okay, what might happen if we tell people in 1960 that the world isn't a globe anymore? Well, let's see. Um, academically, all your physical sciences would have to be retooled. That's everything. You know, geology, hydrology, biology, anything with an ology. 
astrophysics and astronomy <laughs> burned to the ground. That has to be completely redone. The rest at least have a, a fighting chance. And that's in every university in every country ever. Um, the two out of three would be the financial sides. World markets would have to be suspended for months until you figured out what it meant. I mean, the markets are already so twitchy as it is, even though I think they're completely fabricated. And last but not least would be the religious side, which is you're talking about the five major religious houses of the world, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity. You're all giving them, you're giving them leverage simultaneously against science against a civilization that's already been built. The infrastructure is already there. So it's not what they stand to gain, it's what they stand to lose. Do you really want to risk that? You want to put that out there? It's like, I mean, the, the question would come up in your meeting. You'd be like, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> and then I, somebody rattles off that stuff. And you're like, yeah, we're not going to tell anybody until we can figure out exactly how to let people know if we tell them at all. Because the, the blow to the credibility of science would, I mean, they'd be reeling. You're, you're talking about, you know, it's like, okay, so you were wrong about, you know, Earth. What else are you wrong about? Carbon dating, um, uh, the Big Bang, <laughs> evolution. Let's revisit those things, shall we? You know, dark matter. We, we'll just keep going down that road. And it's so, no, you, you have to. I, I look, I'm one of the few people in the conspiracy world that will tell you it's like, look, you have to keep things, to, some things a secret if you can. I personally think they're ready now. Do I think they were ready in 1960? No, no, we freaked people out before. I mean, they saw what happened with the whole Roswell thing back in the 40s. I mean, that was just a stupid spaceship. People were losing it back in the 40s. And, and it's like, you tell people in the 60s, it would just shake them to their core. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know what to do. So uh, there's some secrets that can be kept, and that's another thing. People say, "Oh, it's too big to keep a secret." No, it's so big it can be kept a secret. There's a big. There, there's a difference there. You can compartmentalize and let so few people know, and all you have to do is seal off the outer marker and the upper edge, which they did in the same year, by the way. The Antarctic Treaty was was ratified in 1959, and the Van Allen radiation belts were announced in 1959 by NASA. NASA says, oh yeah, it's super, super deadly up there. Radiation, don't ever go there. Oh yeah, the Antarctica. That, that was the public part. And then the quiet part's like, oh yeah, Antarctica. Yeah, no, don't, no, nobody should go out there ever. Same year, it's quite a coincidence. You know, that's the year they figured out what to do. It's like, you've got to, the, and of course it's what I would do. We, we, that was, sorry, one more thing, which is one of my qualifiers for, for a conspiracy is, I know I said this in the book, is would I do the same thing? If I was trying to, if you're on the other side, don't think of it from a journalist side, don't think of it from a conspiracy side, think of it from the other side, the greater good. If you're on in that camp, the, the, you know, the big long table with people smoking, really dim lights, whatever, do you, do you make those moves? And if you do, why? And that's why what I qualify everything with, which is like, okay, would I have done the same thing? And if I agree, if I look at it, it's like, yeah, yeah, I would have done the same thing. Then it's like, yep, it's my stamp of approval. And that's, that's what it would have been perfect. It's like, yeah, you militarize space, you seal it off. You don't let anyone up there. That's not military and Antarctica, you make sure no one owns it and you just lock it down. Great. Awesome. You make sure no resource, you know, only people down there are scientists and military scientists and bu people building a few camps. That's great. That keep that, that eliminates 90% of your problem, maybe even more. And then the rest is just media. Just keeping everything, you know, reinforcing it, which is, by the way, sorry, I go off on these tears, but you're letting me, which is um, every story, this is your journalist side, which is look at, look at every major network. You have health and beauty and blah, 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 you know, all these different sports and all these different sections. What section do they also have, right? Science. And science always, always has three or four space stories in it. Always, always, always. In fact, the, the face of science, the front man of science might as well be, it's always NASA. And it's all in the stories. They run stories every freaking day, every week. It's just ever accelerating. And the story is always the same, which is, oh yeah, look at this weird thing out near Mars. Oh, look at this top of Jupiter. We're reclassifying Pluto. Saturn's looking really weird. And you know, there's, there's life on, there could be life. These planets 10 light years away. Oh, we found another super planet. Oh, this black hole could kill you. And if I see one more story that they run every two weeks saying, oh, a meteor is going to fly by that, you know, the size of whatever it's like that they do this. I mean, it's, it's like clockwork. There's the, but 
but you remember that it's the subtext. That's where we come in. It's not about space. They could care less if you even read the article. All they want you to do is glance at it just for a second because something on Mars, because you're in a globe. Saturn, globe. Jupiter, globe. That asteroid, globe. It's all just reinforcement. No different than, I know it makes me sound like a conspiracy guy, no different than why you see globes in every freaking television show at some point. Even the, and remember, these aren't, these are, they have people that come in and set up that room. And someone, you're telling me someone in every single set from all these different networks did the same thing? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do you call yourself a conspiracy theorist or what do you? Oh, yeah. I am. Yeah, no question. I mean, I, what I, there's other people that have tried to reclassify it. You know, it's like, oh, I'm from the truth community or whatever. It's like, all right, well, I mean, I, do I believe that there are conspiracies out there that the media won't acknowledge? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I, I could show you them all day long. I could spend literally hours in just about every topic you could think of everything from Tom Brady's phone to did Epstein kill himself to, you know, this shooting over here or this or this. I mean, I've got an opinion on all of them, but you know, do I believe they happen? Yeah. But that's because once I got into flat earth, it opens your mind up to everything, everything. Meaning if you can believe, cause it's, it's literally an umbrella conspiracy over the, the top of it. When I've heard this from a lot of people, cause they'll say once, once I got into flat earth, well, then everything else was possible. Meaning you had to revisit all, if, if they could keep this a secret, then everything else is back on the table. Things you had stuffed into boxes and you were never gonna look at again. And, I, and I've, I've jokingly said that I would, there are people out there that uh, I wouldn't give the time of day to before. You know, it's like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm pretty sure that, that Elvis had Bigfoot's baby, right? And normally I'm like, oh God, go away. But now it's hypocritical. I can't, I can't do that. I, I start my day with flat earth. How, what, what leg do I have to stand on? So I'd be like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> what do you got? Throw it at me. Now I still may hate it at the end, but I won't shoo them out of the room. And the reason why I do that is literally the, the first paragraph of the clues and circling back, which is I had friends six years ago who were convinced, conspiracy guys, convinced that the royal family of England was made up of reptiles, you know, lizard people, convinced of this. And I would come at them and say, yeah, yeah, but what about this flat earth thing? They go, get the hell out of here. I'm like, what are you talking about? You just said lizard people. That's, that's how strong reaction is it, it, we, we have with this. It's very, very polarizing extremely polarizing because of the conditioning it's very it's different from all the other conspiracies because like you said you are shown a globe that little toy in your classroom when you're six years old and it stays in the corner of your classroom at least until you graduate from high school that's 12 years and that's a lot of conditioning so when i mean so people get triggered um i i, I can't remember you probably haven't heard this but the first video i ever clicked on i got flushed I was embarrassed to click on it. And I was alone in a room with the drapes pulled, <laughs> right? And I'd been on the internet a long time. I'd seen some freaky stuff on the internet. Nothing phased me. And it's like some stuff is like, yeah, it's not me, but nothing embarrassed me. This did. And I, I caught myself. I was like, wait a minute. Why am I embarrassed watching this? Why, why am I embarrassed clicking on this? And then it started sinking in. I was like, oh, wow. Wow, it's because I was told this so many times that I was having an adverse reaction to it. And it's brilliant. Again, it's, it's, it, is, it is it is done. It has been a long time coming, but uh, be, given that the internet and if you want to call it misinformation or fake news or whatever, um, the, the, the big difference here is that, and here's your bullet point, is that people now give credibility based on media exposure rather than um, the institution itself. So you will have more people following PewDiePie than you will Anderson Cooper on CNN. And I have talked to kids, you know, if you're under a certain age, it's like, oh yeah, PewDiePie is totally legit. It's like, okay, he buys subs and he's a troll. That's all he does. He's, he's an awful guy. 
and I can give you some great examples of it. But because he has so, because the perceived um, audience is so huge, he, they are he is given as big a seat at the table as mainstream media people, and that's you want you want your mainstream or your um, misinformation comparison. That's what it is. That's what's really changed is when you're under a certain age, you don't know you base literally you base the credibility on how many followers they have or how many likes or how many dislikes or, you know, word on the street. And there's this big disparaging gap between the major networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, those guys, and what else is happening on the internet. And I, I mean, if we fall into that, yeah, maybe, but we built ours from scratch. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to apologize for it. I mean, we, I'll, I'll give you a great, a great, great example. Sorry. I don't want to go too much longer because I know you're probably getting tired, <laughs> which is, when we started this, when, when you did, uh, this is a great example. You can check this out on YouTube and verify it for yourself. When we started this back in 2015, when you typed in flat earth in YouTube, you maybe got 50,000 relevant search results, meaning videos and videos that mentioned it or it was in the description or whatever, 50,000. It's not a lot, right? By the time we hit the middle of 2018, that was almost at 21 million relevant search results, huge spike, massive, massive spike. And this was before the documentary came out. And if I remember may, I remember when it happened because we were, um, we had just passed the president at that point. Trump was at 20.8 million and we were coming in at 20.9 million. And I, I didn't think it was even going to happen for another six months. I was looking at the metrics and it's like, holy smokes, we just this big spike. And I did a video and it's still out there called Flat Earth Passes the President of the United States. And when we when that happened, because I firmly believe, wow, that's loud. Stop. The um the um when I, I when that video, I, I'm fully a big believer that people and there's machines and people that monitor. You know, you, you've heard the rumors, the banks and people in CIA and different agencies listening in, and, and you know, everything I think is categorized and stuff like that. And I think they they were listening to us because we're the only one that was pointing out the scoreboard, and we were, we were saying, look, we're crushing people. We were we were crushing. The only people that were ahead of us were you know small people like Justin Bieber and and uh, Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. Those those people, you know. We're, we're just, I mean, we were higher than just about anyone you could think of. And then I had, I got this phone call and someone said, yeah, the scoreboard's, scoreboard's gone. I go, what do you mean? Our numbers are down. And they go, I go, he goes, no, it's gone. And I go, what do you mean it's gone? I go, we don't come up in the search results. He goes, no, there are no search results anymore. They're gone. And I go, what are you talking about? If you go into YouTube now, you type in any topic, the line that used to say search results equals a number was removed entirely and you say oh no that's delusional it wouldn't be because of you know you guys it's like oh really because there was a congressional hearing about us <laughs> we were tracking so high and i knew i knew i look i grew up with nerds you know i grew up in a video game world i know nerds about as well as anybody i knew that argument i knew the meeting i, I visualized it it was brilliant which was they were trying to stunt our numbers it's like okay we'll like multiply it by 0.7 or 0.6 and have this sliding scale blah 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 and then somebody that calls the shots at the end said you know what why do we even have the numbers at all why 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 not just get rid of it screw it forget this arguing over math you know as far as how we're going to deal with this just get rid of it get rid of the stars and uh, that's what they did they they got rid of it and that was it that was that was summer of 2018 we don't know we don't know how we're tracking anymore because of that and um but we were pummeling the um why was i bringing this up why was i bringing this up this is important crap i don't remember but anyway it was something about the tracking the, the point was is that we were we were tracking so high that people they they didn't know how to deal with us exactly and we were they were they were it was almost like and i've had friends of mine in the community which were saying no they're listening to us man they're watching us for whatever reason. Most of the time in the conspiracy world, no one responds to the conspiracy side, but they were responding to what we were doing. And oh, sorry, back to the social media stuff. Because we were creating this, this, this snowball that was happening out there, they had to downplay the, the momentum of it as best they could. Because again, misinformation, fake news, we were, and it still didn't stop. 
it was just happening behind the scenes and they, you know, they were just hiding the numbers. So anyway, sorry, I get worked up. What else? I have two quick other questions. Okay. So I'm just curious, you know, since this is like your full employment, full-time job, what does your daily life look like in terms of mobilizing the flat earth message? Uh, most of the time, well, well, oh boy. 2020 was way different than 20. I'll give you 2019. Let's let's give it before the virus, <laughs> because before the virus was very very different. Nowadays, I mean, I'm doing what most people do: just get up, get online, and and answer emails and take some phone calls and and see what might happen, and like talk to producers. And then I'm going, yeah, you guys are never your project made. Before that, though, the um, it was basically trying to schedule where we were going to go and like we had conferences in multiple countries or i was gonna you know i, I would be taught i would either be taught doing emails doing podcasts doing interviews or doing on-site public speaking stuff that's really what i did um 2019 was uh, like for example uh i we did i probably uh, will leave some out just because I don't remember them all. I think I, I did conferences in Canada, New Zealand, um, England, two or three in America. I opened the Gather Festival in Stockholm. I never, wasn't even a flat earth conference. wasn't even a conspiracy conference. And they said, oh yeah, you're, you're going to open it. We're going to have a guy interview on you on stage. I'm going, why? Because the, the promoter was one of us. Again, we've got people, sneaky people everywhere. Um, you know, the, and then I, like, and, and I was just doing this back and forth stuff. It was just starting to get ramped up. So like I did a conference in New Zealand, come back. And then all of a sudden I get a phone call, um, from the mobile company down in, in Melbourne, Australia. I said, Hey, can you be down here in 10 days? I'm going, what? Okay. So sure. Then I mean, this is not a fun flight, you know, all, you know, all the way back. And then, um, the same thing happened with London. I, I do a London conference and then spoke in Ireland and, um, oh, Wales. And I, I was all, I, I went to every, basically every airport in, um, in England and then this, did the Stockholm thing and then came back for a morning show. And so I, again, it was, I was, I was so tired of flying. I got, I, I left there, came back and then a morning show called me and said, oh, we want to fly you out. Came back, left again. And then, then the commercial thing, I was like, thank God almost because I was going to have to go back. But yeah, it was, it was kind of turned into a whirlwind. It was an ever escalating thing. The, the documentary, that was a bonus. But well, for example, in 20, uh, we shot the documentary, for example, in um, all of 2017. It took, I think, seven months to shoot. And then it was released. We did the film festivals. That was what I did in 2018. I did film festivals. I traveled around in different places and, and sat in audiences and didn't tell people who I was. And then I would go up if they allowed me to and, and answer questions at film festivals or I talked to people uh, outside of them and promoted the, the movie whenever I could, even though I wasn't a producer. And so, yeah, it really depended on the year. There was no regular year. Like 2015, a lot of um, small podcasts. 20, 2016, bigger podcasts and bigger stuff. And then next thing you know, we, we still didn't, we still have not done, we've done all sorts of stuff in different countries, but we haven't done much here. Meaning, oh yeah, some of the late night shows will, will do skits on us. Sure. But you, Anderson Cooper, like I've done, we've done multiple things with CNN, but not primetime. Uh, but, but then again, we did CBS Sunday morning with uh, Jane Pauley, which was a big one. That was, that was an awesome thing. And then they pulled it from their website because of the backlash. The biggest, the, sorry, one more last thing. The biggest hurdle that we ran into when it came to the media was the potential, the fear. Meaning if we run this story, will we get backlash from the, the public? And the time and tested, yes, you did. I mean, I had, I had guys that saying, hell, I, you heard of Alex Jones? Conspiracy. Yeah, okay. Well, Alex Jones is a big conspiracy guy. He called. He called me early on, and his producers said, "Can we do a show without actually saying the words flat Earth?" And I and they and I go, "It's impossible." How long can we go without saying flat? I go ten minutes, maybe. It's like, sorry, we can't take the risk. And that was a conspiracy show. 
a big one. Um, but I heard this from producers time and time again. Uh, Tr Trinity Broadcasting, big religious network, flew up here, <laughs> sat with me in an hour, for an hour in the living room, shot the whole thing, th sent me a thank you letter later, and never ran it because they were too worried, you know, of the of the implications from the biblical community. And so it's been just bizarre. I have done. I'm not kidding. I can't. I've lost count of how many interviews I've done, which never saw the light of day, because they, you know, everyone's nervous about it. It's a, it's a touchy subject. It's polarizing, which is weird. You know, it's not like other taboo subjects you're not supposed to talk about. Anyway. And you don't have to answer this question. I'm just curious. I saw somewhere that your license plate says it's flat. Is that true? Oh my god. I will do you one better. <laughs> Hang on one second. Flash drive. I've got, well, it, you, have, you haven't watched the trailer to my channel then, obviously. I've the, seen, um, is that, I'm, I'm, that might have been where I saw it. Yeah, 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 one second. Uh, license plates. One sec. View, uh, extra large. Hell, pick a state. I'll give you one. Here's, here's mine. Sorry, I used this for a poster. That's why it was so um, so big. Okay, there it is. Um, yeah, it, I started. I had that one as a backdrop. I made it into a banner. I made it my backdrop for I think a year, and then finally, um, uh, other people started doing it. Now we've got most of the continental United States, and I think half of the Canadian provinces, because those are the only two countries that do vanity plates. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's in fact, if, if you see the trailer, the the channel trailer for YouTube, mm -hmm. it's. I literally run through every one that I had at that point, but you name and so many clever ones, and which which we ju we all also did in the documentary, like not just it's flat, but flat club eight per mile squared, no globe firmament, flat Earth, blah blah blah, it goes on and on and on. So, cool stuff, huh? Yeah, I was just curious. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's still out there, still in the car, and and that's saying something because it used to be I had a vanity plate my old, most of my life. It was Sergeant. My last name because seven letters got away with it mm -hmm. and um yeah the um s uh, but in this case i i saw i was it was i it meant enough to me to change it so awesome. anything else i can answer for you no yeah sweet thank you so much for taking the time to answer all my questions oh yeah, yeah, yeah. happy to do it if you need anything else or any other resources i give you uh, quite a few things but um if you need anything else or any sp specific examples just let me know Okay, awesome. Sweet. Thank you. Enjoy All right. Day. Have a good one.